The power of AI and machine learning can no longer be questioned. The AI winters are now behind us, and most organizations are exploring ways to use these fast-evolving technologies. How can you and your business take advantage? What kind of benefits can you see? Check out this episode of Future Proof to find out. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh here. Year 16, moving right along, folks. We're, we're deep in September, and we're talking all about AI today. Go figure. Large language models, Gen AI, embeddings, all that kind of fun stuff. But we're going to talk about content creation and orchestration and delivery and using AI to really understand what's working and what's not. So to be blunt, I'm very excited about the panel of, of guests we have today. we got our good buddy Eugene Burke online to help me dive into the details here. But we'll also talk to Mark Ruddick and uh, also Shubham Mishra. Mark is from a company called Content.ai and Subham, Subham is from a company called Pixis. And this is very interesting stuff. So let me throw out uh, my my number one complaint, which we've talked about on the show, with respect to social media and marketing and understanding and getting the word out and talking to people and getting them to, to resonate and connect with you, et cetera. Well, the numbers that you get from social media, especially once you start throwing money at this stuff, just go bonkers and they don't really line up. And when you look at how many clicks I got versus how many conversions versus how many views and all this stuff, it, it tends to not make a whole lot of sense. And that's because these different engines have different models by which they calculate things and they're changing the rules. And this is my big beef, quite frankly, is that they change the rules on us and we don't really know what they're changing or how they're changing it. They're private enterprises, so they can do that. But I'm a big fan of transparency and saying, hey, here's what's happening. And let's not remember or let's not forget about uh, third party cookies apparently going away. Well, when that happens, assuming it really does happen, that's like pulling the rug out from underneath every digital marketer in the world, and it's going to be incredibly disruptive. So what does that mean? It means you want to focus on first party data, really understand your customers, know what data you have, be able to correlate that, understand it, and then be able to manage and track all this omni channel communication stuff, which itself is a huge challenge. But it's going to be fun, and I think the two gentlemen on the call today from these companies, and, and Eugene will probably vouch for this, are doing very, very interesting things. So let's focus, maybe first we'll bring in Shubham Mishra uh, from Pixis. Uh, congrats on your funding. That's very exciting stuff. You're uh, growing very quickly. I think you said 200 customers worldwide, and you're doing very interesting things. Tell our audience, what is the upshot of Pixis? How are you helping companies get more for their money in the world of social media and content generation. For sure. So uh, primarily, like uh, we uh, just giving you a background, we started Pixel somewhere around four and a half years back and uh, try, trying to solve this one problem of uh, allocating when, whenever you're spending dollars on digital marketing, it needs to be allocated in the right manner with the right communication at the right time. So uh, solving all the three problems together using artificial intelligence is definitely possible. I would say uh, two or three years back, it was not completely end-to-end -end, uh, doable using AI, but right now you can have all the engines, three engines targeting creative and at the same time performance marketing, all of that could be interlinked and uh, a seamless feedback motion could be built out. And uh, to addressing to your point, that also solves a big problem where uh, there is a huge difference in funnel. There is an amazing level of drop off. It's like unbelievable to see how uh, you get tons of clicks and then there is no conversion. And uh, and in order to in order to solve that, what we did basically we will connect us directly connect into your CRM, which where AI will only look at one data, which is conversion that matters to your business. Because ultimately, everyone is spending money to generate more money out of that. That. so it, it should better do that so uh, that's where our AI systems have been super to the point and uh, I would say one more very interesting piece about uh, the system that we have built out that it it's 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 so seamless that it connects just via uh, a chrome plugin 
So you can deploy the most sophisticated AI just using a Chrome plugin and uh, and it sits inside your existing dashboard. So you don't even have to like uh, go to another dashboard. You can just create one column in your Facebook manager, Google manager. So so it doesn't, it doesn't disrupt your flow because we initially built a lot of uh, panels, dashboards and, and our customers were like, we, don't, we want to use AI, but it should be an operator. So why don't you operate on my dashboard rather than taking me to some other, somewhere else? How interesting is that? You know, we had a great quote the other day on this show. One of the guests said, AI is an implementation detail. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty clever way to, to put things, but you're right. Like where you actually consume the information matters and where you want to consume it is where you normally consume the information. So you're sort of piggybacking on their existing dashboard, but giving them this crucial piece of information, which is, hey, what's working and what's not. And, and to me, that's the kicker, right? Is trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work uh, is a very significant challenge. And you were joking that uh, media buying or media planning should kind of be a thing of the past, in part because you want to let the engine tell you where to put money. Now, I would imagine it takes time, but if you have a critical mass of data already with 200 existing customers, then you know what the workflows look like, you know what the numbers roughly look like, and can fairly quickly map that to new clients. I'm just guessing. Can you talk about that? Absolutely, because uh, what we did basically, we built AI models in the industry by industry level to, and also a generic model which which uh, picks up all the learnings from all the, all the models, so that's gen generic parameters. But as as the system gets more and more confidence in every um, every sector, it becomes so powerful that the moment, uh, like for example, just give you an example, if uh, we have some uh, users who are using banking uh, in bank uh, us in banking then a new person who is who applies a solution already starts from uh, a level one or two and they're not starting from level zero so obviously there is a learning curve that is built in uh, but but it's so seamless that it connects directly with your existing workflows all your existing uh, uh, dashboards and all your existing uh, places that it, it becomes seamless and so if I understand it correctly, you are connecting to, of course, these external sources like Facebook, Instagram, that the endpoints, if you will, where the content is delivered and you're pulling some data from them to see what they say. But then you're also kind of sitting in the middle between those worlds and the content management system or CRM or whatever system that the client has. So you're kind of sitting in between those worlds, taking data back and forth and feeding scores essentially to the client so that they can better understand what to buy. And then I'm guessing you've got some automated workflows you could put on top of that. Is that right? Exactly, because uh, I would say a recommendative AI is definitely interesting, but it's 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 slowly becoming the thing of the past. If AI is super powerful and if it is competitive enough, then it should go ahead and take actions. And the mm -hmm. actions should ultimately result into cost savings. So for us, the way we define a solution, it's like, a uh, very strong robotic process automation coupled with the most powerful brain of artificial intelligence. Wow, that's pretty cool. Well, let's stick around for the round tables. Let's bring Mark Ruddick in from content.ai. And I know, Mark, you're a brand new CEO over there at uh, Content AI, so you're uh, just getting the ball rolling. But you're doing another piece of this puzzle, which is the content orchestration and getting this content to all these different endpoints. I mean, I remember the first time I heard Omnichannel, I was like, oh, what is that? It doesn't sound good. And then I figured out what it was. I was like, oh, I was right. It's, it's a pain because you have all these different endpoints, you know, from a design perspective, that's why people use React and things of this nature. But from a design perspective, it's kind of a nightmare. And that's just one part of the challenges, right? It's also how the content gets fed, how it's displayed, how it gets consumed, et cetera. So you're targeting another really critical part of this whole challenge from the content orchestration side. Tell us a bit about that and how it works. Yeah, I mean, maybe the best way for me to explain what we do is to, to kind of tell you a real client story without naming names. Imagine if you're a multi-product, multi-brand, multi-region company. You've got 600 websites around the world and you publish in 20 languages and you operate in multiple locations with different regulatory regimes, different localization rules, different norms, etc. You don't really want to be cutting and pasting that content across M by M sites and then trying right. to manage it out there in the wild. So what we right. do is we enable companies like that 
to manage their content in a central location and then move it very rapidly out to the places in which it is used. But most importantly, we help that entire content supply chain of governance and you know, reuse, language translation, localization, and so on, all operate in an increasingly automated fashion. And so, you know, if you are a company with 600 websites and 20 languages and multiple products, um, we are sort of the, the solution to that problem. And I think the interesting place that, that intersects with Shubham's work is that increasingly, we're not just looking at the content supply chain of moving content out to the front line, but we want to collect the efficacy of that content, how it works, and bring that back into the systems so that the next time content gets created, it is even more compelling and even more effective. Mm -hmm. And so what we are doing across that entire supply chain is leaning very heavily into AI in order to provide a lot more automation and to reduce the cost and the kind of mechanical turf that exists today in these companies between a piece of content being created and where it ends up in the world. Yeah. Well, and I know like for YouTube, for example, there is tremendous data that you can pull about when someone stopped watching it, how long they watched. And uh, one of the companies I talked to that does this sort of analysis, this girl is amazing. She was talking about how there are best practices for when the logo shows up, there's best practices for when the call to action comes in, for the, the colors, the graphics, the music, all this stuff comes into play. And if I'm hearing you correctly, you're able to pull that data and associate it with the with the particular piece of content and give some sort of score on that. So this one is doing very well with this demographic, that one's not doing so well. And all this speaks to the need to be very agile with your content, which is a difficult thing, or at least it used to be difficult. Now it's going to be a little bit easier with generative AI and the content creators are gonna be using some of these technologies and then really polishing and fine tuning and, and cherry picking. What do you think? I think that's what Shubham does really well today. That sort of that end point analysis. We would, we would love to plug into that end point analysis and feed it right back into the beginning of the orchestration process so that the next content that gets created is optimized for that. So I think, I think we're actually in a way kind of complementary. I think our, uh, our primary role today is in helping companies write, validate, and then move content into the endpoints in which it's going to be consumed, meeting governance and other needs along the way. Um, where we want to get to with AI in particular is leveraging the information, for example, from something like Shubham's app to then retrain the AI so that the next content that comes out is structured and, you know, positioned and tagged in a way that is going to generate an even greater yield. And that notion of automating the return on content is, I think, a really interesting place. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so you're sort of in a CDP space. It's almost like a, a, a supercharged content management system is kind of what it sounds right. like to me, right? Because media companies, of course, typically historically have built their own content management systems. These days, a lot of them just use WordPress and, uh, you know, kind of rely on that as their horse and they try to optimize it. But it's always been a very complex space in part because the ontologies underneath can be complex and, and just the moving parts. And when you try to th try to start adding stuff, it just gets harder and harder to manage that. So you're sort of offloading a lot of that headache and work for your clients by giving them an engine which does all that stuff. Is that right? We have clients that have 900,000 pieces of content. <laughs> and today, or historically, those clients manage that content largely manually. Um, and we give them a system in which they can properly organize that content, apply the appropriate taxonomy to it so that it can be reused and so on. Where we are leaning into with AI is automating that process of analyzing the existing content repositories that they have, using the AI to better organize those content repositories, using the AI to identify which content is working and which is not working, and, and automate the process of optimizing that whole content place. And, and I think mm -hmm. that that is um, it's a really interesting problem. When you've got 900,000 pieces of content, how on earth do you keep it fresh? truly Eric Cavanaugh with an all-star cast. Once again, a good buddy, Eugene Burke is here, but we're also talking to Mark Ruddick and uh, Shubham Mishra. 
And uh, Shipham was making a point right before the last break, and he was answering a question from Eugene about where in the workflows does uh, does Pixis automate and help? And you had started answering that question, but basically where along the line are you tackling some of the more unwieldy challenges to be able to automate stuff such that people can get more done and and, uh, and get it done better? Go ahead, Shipham. For sure. Uh, like in terms of where Pixis integrates in the workflow for automation, I would say three pieces. For And it's exactly uh, very first principle based thinking because the first piece is where you need to identify whom to target. So our systems integrate with the CRMs. It understands the CRMs, your conversion data. It connects with your Facebook, Google channel and all, all the different platforms, delivery platforms maps it out, connects, overlaps the data with uh, different data sources, external data sources like SEMrush, SimilarWeb, to understand your comp competitor, how your competitor is do uh, doing the marketing right now. And at the same time, then it will throw out certain keywords or certain, I would say, cohorts that you should be targeting. That's the first step. Now, for example, if it threw out a cohort that you should be targeting uh, uh, male, 25 to 30 year old in Philadelphia. Now, the second step is how do you design a content for that? So what we did basically, we have our own LLM systems, which could be hyper tuned based on that, that region itself. How do we do that? There is a scraper technology built in, which goes out there and it'll scan up all, uh, all the, I would say all the information, all the data, uh, and what what is liked by 25 to 30 year old in Philadelphia? What are they reading? Which what kind of blogs are they reading? It feeds it back into the LLM. The LLM gets skewed so that whenever whatever copy you have written as a as a brand, it rewrites it in a manner that it becomes hyper personalized, <laughs> slangs and everything, just wow. uh, in that region. The third piece is now. Uh, it, when you do both these things, you create a problem. You create a problem of too many because now you have, uh, earlier you were running like two or three advertisements, one or two variations, it was easy. Uh, you can just throw in like two more people in the team and it could be managed. But now imagine doing it at scale where you have published like 1500 ads and everything uh, has to be managed in a manner and if you if you and budgets have to be distributed if you're spending like 20 million dollars it has to be distributed across all of them in the rightful manner and at across six channels like facebook mm -hmm. twitter instagram all of them so that's a third piece which all all of it gets converged over there we have uh, simple algorithms for a client to spend little money like multi-arm bandits, not real, I would say not the real AI, but uh, multi-arm bandits could do the job if you're spending less. To the other level where we have LLMs uh, just to optimize and take decisions on your behalf. So, and the best part is we have connected it directly to uh, Facebook and Google's uh, releases, release notes. So it can keep reading that if there is any change in the algorithm which they are bringing about and, and stuff, oh. it'll, it'll transform. That allows you to end to end do uh, all the three pieces. And also there is a feedback loop which is connected. So it allows you to do all of it in, in no time. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, uh, you know, Eugene and I are working on a bit of a stealth project and we may need to talk to you in greater detail about that last part. <laughs> Because uh, using the notes, the release notes, that's something I talked about just yesterday, plugging that in as an embedding such that the, the system knows, okay, that has now been updated. This now works with that. I mean, wow, <laughs> that's some pretty cool stuff. But Eugene, take it away. Yeah, Mark, I understood your particular approach to this challenge is really on the logistics of create centrally, but distribute to the edge intelligently. Tell me how you guys approach that. Yeah, and in fact, I, let me answer the, the sort of AI question as well, because mm -hmm. we are we're de dealing actually with very different kinds of content today. So, you know, if you are looking at a client of ours who's a healthcare provider who is trying to ensure that really precise healthcare data is moved to their frontline workers or maybe to their extranet, to their doctor network, there is no way that content can be fully AI automated today. It's 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 impossible for that to happen. It is too risky and and so on. So let me let me walk you through the world of today, and let me be walking through the world of AI in those big companies. Mm -hmm. So the world of today is there's an entire mechanical Turk of people that has to review that content after it is written in the first draft before it gets anywhere near a public consumption. That includes brand people. It includes 
you know, the typical editors, it includes localization, it includes translation perhaps, and it includes lawyers, because nothing is going to go out there unless it meets the M by N box of what's allowed where. Mm -hmm. That is a very complex, time-consuming, expensive process. What AI is going to do is not write that content automatically going forward, but what it's going to do, as soon as the writer finishes the content, or even as, the, as they are writing that content, it is going to be highlighting for that writer the issues that they are likely to fail on downstream in the workflow. It's going to bring mm -hmm. it right to them and say, you know what, this is not going to pass legal review. This is not going to pass brand <laughs> review. You need to rewrite this in a tone of voice change. This is not going to pass localization review in Florida. And so before we waste time sending it downstream for review, right. we, we get it, the, the issues captured up front. That is the way in which AI is going to influence our supply chains going forward. What I think is, is happening in, in the more kind of direct retail advertising world is a lot more free form. That's not going to be possible in our customers for some time to come. So tremendous AI involvement in that workflow, but not complete AI automation, not not end to end, you know, computers writing. I would agree to with you, Mark, that pharma and healthcare and and health insurance are are use cases that are very, very difficult to automate, very difficult to inject intelligence into. And if you can get some kind of widget that will jump up and down on top of the lawyer's desk to make them move faster, <laughs> or or to make it so that so issues don't appear uh, in the lawyer's inbox, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, or even if it arrives at the lawyer and the thing says, hey lawyer, these are five areas that I've flagged you should really take a close look at. You don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to read every word every time. I, th I think that's where you start to see significant incremental improvements. Yeah. And we were talking before about how even in, in the U.S. there are, is a, a complexity of the regulatory regime such that content that's fine in Oklahoma cannot show up in California and content that is fine in California may not show up in Utah for various reasons. And so be, having intelligence to be able to flag issues in the content authoring, creation, review and publication or deployment process um i've seen this process take you know, on the minimum six to eight weeks where you have to think okay it's the beginning of may i need to get this content out by the fourth of july do i have time right and it really should mm -hmm. not be that time consuming yeah look i think there really are some point. really interesting ideas coming here right away one of them is you talk about the first draft of content that has to go to Florida, has to go to Oklahoma, has to go to whatever. Today, that has to be written multiple times. But what if the AI drafts the Oklahoma version, drafts the Florida version and yeah. so on, so that, that at least you've got a head start on that's the same thing with localization and translation. I think that's where you're going to start to see some real benefit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. No, this is this is very interesting. And then, you know, not to open up a big old can of worms here more than halfway through the show, but when you start talking about regulatory regimes and policies, you know, it's been probably five or six years now since I ran into my first um, AI infused contract management system at an SAP conference where they can look at all of your contracts and if some rule changes, they can say, hey, you need to look at this contract, that contract and that one because you're gonna have exposure now. That starts to get very, very interesting in terms of managing contracts, managing compliance, all this stuff. I mean, let's be honest, compliance is a pain, right? It just, it is, it's a pain to deal with, but I think it's not gonna be nearly as much of a pain to deal with going forward because with these new models, you understand that these the Gen AI models don't just know text, they're not just text predictors, but they also understand syntax. And when you start getting to syntax and causal relationships and things of this nature, that starts to get into understanding policy and where policy should be in effect and where it should not be in effect. So I think it's, it's getting very interesting now in a lot of very good ways because two kind of the points we're all sort of making, and Shibham, I'll throw this over to you, a lot of that stuff is just hindrance, it's risk management, it's, uh, it is important because you don't want to get penalized, I understand all that, but it's sure not very productive and it sure isn't really adding value to the company. So the more you can automate that and deal with those issues dynamically and then have an audit trail, and that's what the auditors are always going to want is some audit trail. That's going to be, you know, talk about giving comfort to the creative people. Creative people don't like to be put in boxes, but Shimham, what do you think about all that? 
No, absolutely, because uh, even even I believe uh, in the direction that AI could also be a very good uh, uh, as it is it's a very good taskmaster. It could also be a very good checking system. So it can scan the stuff, and it can and and uh, if you can see the riser for models. Uh, on the side of uh, image recognition in terms of text recognition and making sense of all of it has evolved to a, a level where this could be possible where uh, and you can feed in the, where the syntax could be updated by a bunch of counsel of real lawyers and at the same time uh, once that is approved that could be the central thing uh, and then you don't have to govern everything so and uh, open that up to all the brands uh, like all the all the legal teams and and stuff so that you can you can stay compliant and do your work fast mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, and uh, maybe Eugene, I'll get you to comment on this. There was this story of a lawyer who went on used ChatGPT to come up with his uh, his defense or of a particular client, and he went and he got just ripped apart because the ChatGPT invented the cases and all this kind of stuff like that. I realize that is a funny story, and that person was a fool to to do all that and not to vet things. But to me, it's almost like a red herring because I got to tell you this. If you're an attorney and you're out there working in the world today and you don't pay attention to this whole technology space, you're just going to get bulldozed because it's going to get to the point where it's fun. And, you know, Shubham was talking about this, having industry specific large language model ontologies, basically, which is what everyone's talking about. Praxy Data is talking about that. Uh, we're talking about that. Other people, they've kind of figured this out. So if you don't get on that train pretty quickly, it's going to be a very unpleasant scenario for you. So I, I, what, what I'm saying is, yes, that story is funny, but don't think that because some guy got in trouble, you shouldn't be looking into this technology and leveraging it as best you possibly can. What do you think, Eugene? Yeah, absolutely. I think that as we expose some of these rough edges and we start to... So Shibam was talking about hyper-training models. So the guts of the architecture is becoming more and more refined such that you can rely upon it to make logical inferences according to the um, semantic rules that can right. be audited right and so if you're positioned in the marketing space and you're not looking at uh taking making the the most advantage of this kind of technology 10 of your competitors are already uh, in proof of proofs of concept kind of projects already testing it out. And so inside the company, you have to be thinking about um, getting your governance, your regulatory compliance people, uh, getting their minds around that these tools are going to be competitive pressures from the outside. And just kind of pre pretending that they, they don't exist and we can wait is going to be a losing strategy. Yeah. You know, content is king and content will always be king and i think humans are going to remain in this process and the more humanized your content is the better off you're going to be so you use these tools almost like you think of industrial agriculture you use these big machines turbines to go through and and, and gin up the soil and get all that stuff going but it's the care and the art of the human at the end that's going to make this stuff really work what do you think well, look, I think my my creative friends would say that, that they can see the difference between a piece of really well thought through human creative and a piece of machine creative today. That line may actually start to blur. I think the right. more interesting question is, how is AI assisted content creation going to transform the nature of content? And how is it going to democratize creativity and allow people to create content that perhaps they it might never have been able to, whether it's written content or, or visual. That's a really interesting problem. I think when we when we start to think about the, you, you kind of got first order and second order AI, right? First order AI is the basic stuff we've been seeing and playing with that has hallucinations and other things. Second order AI are these deep LLMs now being trained for specific purposes where they do extremely well along those vectors. That federated model, I think, is a model we believe in where you know, you're going to be able to dock a legal LLM or perhaps, a, you know, I don't know, a localization LLM or whatever. And that as a whole is going to get you something really compelling in the same way that we've got video editors and visual creators and so on at the, the front end. So it's a federated model in our opinion. It's going to be very interesting to knit it all together.